So we're going to continue with our discussion of the tissues, looking at our next tissue, which is a, again, kind of get everybody's attention. We're looking at the next connective tissue, which is adipose tissue, also known as fat. The special thing about adipose tissue, it is, has the ultimate ability to get larger and larger and larger and grow in size indefinitely. So you've seen, at, um, you know, shows on television, my 600 pound life, right? So if we bring in extra calories that we don't need to sustain life for metabolism and activity, that ex those extra calories are converted to adipose tissue or to, to, to these fat, drop fat droplets. So if you look at adipose tissue, it kind of looks like chicken wire, doesn't it? You have these big open spaces because when we stain this tissue, the oil droplets don't take up the stain, only the edges of the cell take up stain. So there's the thin edges, and you can see a nucleus that's pushed to the edge of the cell. So when you look at this under a microscope, you're going to see these big open, open cells, kind of looking like chicken wire. So we need fat on our body, obviously, for stored energy. So if there's a famine, our body has a place to go to get energy to maintain life. So that's why we have this ultimate ability to grow larger and larger fat cells is because our body doesn't want to waste any energy that's coming in should there be a, you know, a reduction in the food supply. So it's important to have some fat in our body because it's also good for cushioning. If you've ever worked in the nursing home with the elderly and as we age, the fat layer goes down significantly and they're more subject to bruising, more subject to skin tearing, and less insulation as well. If you look at the thermostat in a nursing home, it'll be like 80 degrees, right? And then if you're young and running around taking care of those clients or patients, you're getting pretty hot because you have more insulation and you're moving more. So um, we need that for insulation, for energy storage, and for cushioning this adipose tissue. And we grow the fat cells during development um, up to puberty. Once we hit puberty and we're done growing, we have all the fat cells we're ever going to have. So all we do from that point on is control the size of those fat cells. So when we lose weight, we're shrinking the fat cells. We're not reducing the number of fat cells. Okay, So that's why childhood obesity is such a concern. When we overfeed our kids and they sit in front of the television all the time, they're growing more fat cells that they're going to bring into adulthood and they're going to struggle with their weight lifelong. So we really need to, to take charge of our kids' eating habits and activity levels. I tell my kids all the time, you know, it's time to get off the television or get off the video game and go outside and just force them outside. They have to be active outside. If they get to stay in the house near those devices and the television, that's how they're getting, you know, overweight. And 55% of Americans are overweight or obese in this country, and that is a huge health hazard. I can tell you from my experience on the cardiopulmonary unit where I work at the hospital is that's the number one risk factor for everything they come in for is obesity. So it's something that we really need to take seriously, consider our diets, consider our activity levels, and the quality of life as we get older, when we bring in all that extra weight over a lifetime, we see heart disease, we see knee replacements. Number one reason for hip and knee replacements is lifelong obesity. When we carry this extra weight on, <laughs> not injury, not injury, but you didn't get your knee replaced. No. You just had surgery, yeah, on a specific part, right. But I'm talking about knee replacement. It's because over a lifetime when a person is carrying around an extra 50 or more pounds on, those, on that frame, that cartilage between the joints simply wears out. So it's not aging always that causes grandma or grandpa to have bad knees and not be able to go to the soccer games and the football games or walk at the festivals. It's because grandma and grandpa has had lifelong obesity carrying around extra weight and their joints are simply worn out. So the best thing a person can do is lose the weight, then get the knee replacement, and that'll last a lot longer than if we carry that weight along, get the knee replaced, and you know, not correct the problem. So if you're a young person struggling with weight, if you want to have that quality of life and have good joints in your older years, lose the weight now and protect your skeleton because we can't 
you think about being overweight by 50 pounds, it's like having a six or seven year old on your back carrying it around everywhere you go. And if you look at athletes in high school that are overweight and they're running up and up and down and all over and they're twisting and turning and they're carrying that extra weight again, it's like carrying a 30 to 40 pound weight and trying to play sports that way where those kids are gonna, they're gonna have joint damage and injury. So it's really important that we control our weights early on to prevent that joint damage. Yes. No, no. Sometimes, but um, some babies are just born with a little extra adipose. But usually, by the time, what you do is you look at the growth curve with the pediatrician. So when you look at kids, when they get to be three, four, they start to lose that baby weight and they should start to be more proportional height to weight. So there's a growth curve that you look at and you want to be in the, you know, the average percentile for their age, of course. But um, around three to four is when kids start to lose that baby weight and start to thin out. Even in getting into the elementary years, it might even be like five or six. But when, it gets to, when a child is consistently um, on the top of the growth chart for weight and not height, that's when it becomes a concern. So the pediatrician can pretty much guide you know, a parent on that. And then when a female hits puberty and undergoes menstruation, that's when the metabolism changes a little bit and, there's, and the hormones of, of puberty, which are estrogen, encourages fat deposition. So you see that with younger kids when they're growing. Prior to puberty, you see this growth spurt and they're thin. And then once uh, that puberty stops and women, in particular females, start to menstruate, that growth slows and then you see um, you know, weight start to to increase. So that's where it becomes more. No, then once, like I said, once puberty is complete, then it's just the increase of the size of those fat cells. And that's why like high school coaches like to have the freshmen and sophomores. Sometimes those are the real performers in the speed, you know, sports like track because they haven't entered puberty yet and they're carrying less weight and they can peak at like their sophomore year. Not everybody, of course, right? But that's what we tend to see. And as, as girls, you know, finish puberty and they've all had their period for a couple of years or maybe just started depending on their age, you know, the juniors and seniors getting a little heavier. Um, the joints, because puberty is complete, the, the, pelvic, the, the pelvic bones move into their adult position for childbirth and that throws things off in the knee. So we see more knee injuries in juniors and seniors. And again, this is, you know, there's individual variations, but this is a general tendency. So this falls into the three, when you said that they are skinnier when they're younger and then they get even bigger. I've seen that they get bigger when they're younger and gotten a lot skinnier. During the period of growth, right. But when that growth is, yes, especially among boys, right? You see boys get a little chubbier around 10, 11. Oh, okay. I've seen it in boys, you know, they get a little chubbier around 10, 11, 12, and they have a big growth spurt up to 16, 17, where they thin out. And then again, after 18 and beyond, they start to stabilize, yeah. Okay, so the, ne um, so the next types of tissues we're gonna talk about are cartilage. So there's three types of cartilage in the body. Hyaline is the one that you need to know for lab, but there's two others as well. The key thing about cartilage that makes it unique is that there are no blood vessels or nerves in cartilage. So when you tear cartilage, you don't feel that cartilage tear in and of itself. You'll feel the injury to the tissues around it. So there will be pain when you tear you know, a, a ligament or, a, I'm sorry, um, cartilage, but not necessarily right within the cartilage itself. Because when people have a knee injury, as Janan can attest to, sometimes they'll say, okay, we're gonna stabilize this knee, we'll see you next week or in six weeks when the cell swelling goes down and we'll have surgery at that time. They didn't do surgery right away on your knee injury, did they? Yeah, because it's not gonna heal. We don't have to worry about healing issues because it has no blood vessels to bring healing factors to it. So we have to do surgery oftentimes to repair those torn cartilages. And if they're partial tears, sometimes we just leave them alone. I had a friend who was in her mid-30s and the doctor said, well, yeah, you've got a torn ACL, but you're 35. We don't really need to repair it if you don't want to. 
So she felt like an old horse being sent out to pasture. They didn't want to tear, repair her knee. And she said, well, I want to repair my knee. I want to ride my bike and go for walks and not have this unstable knee. So they did repair it for her. But the key thing, no blood vessels or nerves, so it has a poor healing capacity. We usually need to perform surgery or use cadaver um, tendons or ligaments to prepare, to, um, not tendons or ligaments, cadaver, um, ACL, or that's a ligament. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the, the discs, meniscus, yes. Those are cartilage, and those need to be repaired or replaced if they're severely damaged. So hyaline cartilage looks like that fisheye soup, very flexible, rubbery tissue. The middle one here, fibrocartilage, is a little tougher, and it has these thick collagen fibers all running in the same direction, but can you see the fisheyes scattered among there? So it's still a cartilage, but it's called fibrocartilage, and this is the toughest of the cartilage. So we see these in the intervertebral discs, like when people have a you know, ruptured disc or torn disc in the, between the vertebrae, these are really tough. And we also find it connecting the pelvis in the front, forming the pubic symphysis. There's a little bit of cartilage in between those two hip bones on either side. And then elastic cartilage has elastin fibers scattered throughout, so it looks a little fuzzy in the background. And this is what we see in the ear. This is the most flexible of the cartilages, so your ear is elastic cartilage. So when people pierce an ear um, in the cartilage, um, there's not a lot of blood there because that tissue, again, doesn't um, have blood vessels. Um, it's still painful as you're piercing through the skin, but the cartilage itself doesn't have any nerves, so that's not as um, painful either. Sometimes, though, they have a hard time healing, again, you know, around that because cartilage doesn't heal, so you're just looking to heal the skin around it, and that cartilage remains a whole. All right, another group of tissues are the bone tissues, another connective bone. We have spongy bone and compact bone. Another name for spongy bone is cancellous bone. What's unique about this is it has a rich blood supply. So unlike cartilage, which won't heal unless we go in and surgically repair it, bone heals very quickly. So if you have a small crack or a small break in your bone and you don't go in to get it looked at, that can cause irregular growth as it tries to repair itself. And that happens very quickly. So very rich blood supply running down the center of each osteon here that makes up compact bone. This is a blood vessel. So we have them running sideways through their bone and down the middle of each bone unit, which we'll study when you get to the skeletal system. So it's the hardest of all the tissues because it has that calcium phosphate in it. Where would what? The blood is actually in between the little fibers of bone. Yep, the bone marrow, red bone marrow. Yep. And we'll talk about that when we get to the skeletal system. Another connective tissue, we don't think of it as a connective tissue, but it really is. It's the only liquid tissue that we see, so it can flow through the body. Blood is actually a tissue. It's made up of different cells with different functions. So the matrix is the plasma, that's the fluid. And then the cells are the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So blood is a tissue. We find um, other types of a blood-like tissue in the bone marrow. The red and yellow bone marrow is a fluid tissue um, similar to blood. It has stem cells in it. It's called hemopoietic tissue. I don't expect you to know that name. Just know that blood is a tissue, okay, and that the matrix, the fluid part of blood is our plasma. Muscle tissue is in its own category in muscle, so we classify it as muscle, and there's three types. There's skeletal muscle that causes us to move our bones, it attaches to our bones. Smooth muscle propels substances inside of our body, except for the erector pili muscle in the skin, that's a smooth muscle that causes goose pumps. And then cardiac muscle is the muscle that contracts our heart. So when your heart is pumping blood, relaxing and contracting, that's cardiac muscle. And we'll go into the specific types when we get into those systems related to that. So just know the three types of muscle. What makes it special? It has a good blood supply like bone does. So if you tear a muscle, it's going to be painful, but it will heal itself. But if you tore you know, the, the tendons related to that muscle, that's going to take longer, right? Because that has a less of a blood supply, that dense, regular collagenous. Um, so, but it has a rich blood supply, nerves, you can feel an injured muscle, and when muscles 
um, get fatigued, you can feel that soreness, so definitely has a good nerve supply. And then lastly, nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is only found in the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. And what's special about it is it can conduct electrical signals. It has ion channels on the surface that can change, that can open and close depending on electricity. So we'll talk about that when we get to the nervous system. And then there's these tiny little cells in the background, the little black dots called neural glial cells that support the larger cells, which are the neurons, which can conduct electrical impulses. The neural glial cells don't conduct impulses, they just support and nourish the, neural, the neurons. So again, what's special is they can conduct electrical signals. And they're not able to regenerate. So once you form all the nerves you have or neurons at the end of puberty, that's all you get. So very little regeneration possible. So when a person has a stroke, we don't see new neurons developing. We have to try to retrain other parts of the brain to take over those damaged areas. But there's a lot of research going on, and sometimes we can see a little bit of regeneration. So there's a lot of study going on into that. But in general, we can say that neurons don't rapidly replace themselves, like bone cells do, because you know they have that rich blood supply, and they're able to undergo mitosis, but not neurons. So when you think of these tissues and you're looking at them under a microscope this semester, just know that these tissues occur in layers. So if I look at this blood vessel, this is a capillary, it's the tiniest of blood vessels. It's made of simple squamous epithelium on the inside. So it's one layer of flattened cells forms the inside of our capillaries. And then outside of that is smooth muscle, which will contract, right, to increase or decrease uh, blood pressure. So it'll open up the vessels. if it relaxes and it'll constrict or narrow the vessels if it contracts. And then what holds this capillary in place are connective tissues, keeping it in whatever location it's, it's found in the body. So these tissues are always occur in layers. So when we look at a lab exam, be sure you're looking at the tip of the arrow and looking at the specific layer that we're referencing for the lab exam. So again, when you look at their ability to regenerate, our skin, those epithelial tissues can repair themselves, bone, areolar tissue, dense, irregular, any blood forming tissue, they can replace themselves. Smooth muscle, smooth muscle, dense, regular connective ligaments and tendons have a moderate ability to regenerate. And like I said, virtually none are the heart and brain. So that's a problem, right? So if you damage your heart muscle cells from a heart attack, those heart muscle cells can't grow back and replace themselves. So people that have had heart attacks and damage to muscle cells because of that, they have reduced heart function. So we're always looking at trying to maximize what cells are left and keeping them functioning at their peak. Same thing with the brain tissue. So when we look at how tissues get damaged and how they repair, it's important to see two different ways of repair. If you really rip yourself open, fall over on a bike and you have a large, you know, open area where we can't bring the two edges together because some of that skin is still on the pavement, right? That's going to have to heal by secondary union. So the edges start to uh, work toward the center. So it's just going to fill in from the outside. That's secondary union. Primary union is when, say, you undergo, you know, a surgery and we you know, make a nice clean slice, we open up the skin, we do our surgery, and then we close it up with, with sutures. The edges are close together, and uh, over time it starts to heal. So if we look at this example here, the top, this is where it would heal. If we look here, the edges, are they close together? Mm, not really. We could bring them together with a suture, right? But what happens if you look from this diagram over to here, we can see which direction is it healing first, from the inside out or the outside in? From the inside out. So here we can still see the, it's separated at the surface, but it's healed down deeper. And this is an important concept to keep in mind when you have a patient that comes back a week after surgery and says, oh my gosh, look at my incision from the doctor, it's, it's open. My guts are going to fall out if we don't fix this. I need to get in, right? But you can tell them, no, it's open at the surface, but it's actually healed down below, and you're going to be okay. So it's important that we you know, recognize we heal from the inside out. But now if this 
happen if you see an opening a day after surgery that's pretty serious then we could see guts coming out and that does happen that people eviscerate and their guts come out after abdominal surgery for example so that's really serious and we need to take care of that because of the infection area but there's a special type of tissue when we see secondary union occurring it's called granulation tissue so if you look on the far right hand side of the screen here we see that kind of vascular see the tiny little blood vessels even but if I look at the edge of that wound do I see redness and swelling no so that's actually a really healthy normal healing wound we don't want to do I want to put a dry piece of gauze on top of that because what's going to happen when I rip that gauze off tomorrow it's going to tear off all that nice healing granulation tissue and that wound has to start over again so there's something in nursing we call wet to dry which means we're going to put a saline soaked gauze on top of that so it's wet up against the wound and then I'm going to put a dry dressing over that so when I go to take that off it's moist and it's still healing underneath and it's covered so it's not out in the open but it's not going to rip off that nice granulation tissue and if I look at this this is a stoma this is where the inside of the intestinal wall has been brought to the outside and we're going to put a tube that's going to lead directly to an organ now it's red that's a good sign a beefy red stoma or opening with a tube access to an organ this might be going to the bladder this might be going to the digestive tract that's a healthy color because red means good blood supply right what happens if I choke someone what color are they going to turn blue or purple if I saw a blue or purple stoma would that be a good sign no that means poor blood supply very serious you need to call somebody right away but these are healthy indicators but the key thing is this one because sometimes we're going to see wounds when someone's in from a car accident if you see healthy red and you look at the edges and you don't see heat you know um, redness inflammation swelling that's not infection that's healthy stuff and that's granulation tissue so as you complete that worksheet now I think you'll feel more confident in some of the terms hopefully and that concludes the tissue